Member for Mirabuka. Thank you, um, Acting Speaker. Uh, Acting Speaker, I rise to talk um, to this bill, the Forest Products Amendment Bill, and um, I'm, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to do so for a number of reasons. And uh, firstly, I want to acknowledge that I think this is an important bill because it recognises the importance of government acting on issues of climate change. Now, it should be self-evidently true that governments need to do this, but um, you can't help but compare the work of this government with what we've had from the federal um, Liberal National Government for many, many years in this space, where they've in fact had a policy of um, deny, ignore, pretend climate change is not real, and I think they've done a great disservice to um, the people of Australia by doing that. So while it should be self-evidently true that governments need to take the issues of climate change seriously and implement and act good legislation, good policy initiatives, even when they are difficult, uh, that hasn't been true of our federal government, but I'm very pleased to be a part of a government that's approaching that head on. We know that young people are very concerned about issues of climate change. Many, many people, not just young people as well, are also concerned. Um, and so all around the world, governments and industry are getting on with the business of adapting and managing a transition. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be a part of a government that is also doing that. I'm also very pleased to have the opportunity to talk about this bill because I think it is um, a very forward-looking bill and it's one uh, that has a focus in its heart of creating new jobs and finding new opportunities for industries that are being affected by climate change. So confronting that issue head on and making sure that we have um, sound plans that won't leave communities high and dry, but will in fact assist them in making really important transitions to ensure that uh, as change comes, whether we like it or not, change is coming. And as that happens, working people and their communities uh, will have the tools and resources and the time that they need to be able to adjust and adapt um, and making sure that they've uh, got the funds and the resources and the government support that will allow them to do that. Uh, and I think, members, the other thing that uh, this bill makes me think about and reflect on is really uh, that it takes a very mature government to be able to do that. Uh, it takes a Labor government, in fact, to be able to bring together um, the parties and to uh, confront these kind of difficult issues head on. So uh, time and time again what we've seen is that it's a maturity of Labor governments with their partnership uh, that has the ability to manage structural change in the economy and find outcomes that will protect communities, that will protect working people and will ensure that there are new industries for people to go and work in. Now in this instance it's as we grapple with climate change, uh, but we know there's been transitions in the economy throughout time and we know that there are many communities, many industries that are grappling with the question of climate change. And I'm very pleased to be a part of a government that has the maturity to be able to do the work that we need to do to be able to manage those transitions in a way that protects the economies, protects the communities, protects working people. Um, and so I want to commend the Minister and, and all of the Cabinet, in fact, for their work in this area, because I think it is so important. I think it's extremely important that we as a government manage those transitions um, and have the maturity, the vision and the dedication to do that, even when it's difficult to do it even when it's difficult to do that. And I think anyone who doubts um, the, the approach of this government only needs to look at what the federal um, Liberal national governments have um, not done in this area to understand that they lack the maturity, certainly, but also lack that dedication and the ability to bring partners together to find outcomes. So uh, there's no doubt um, that this is important work and this is an important bill. I also want to um, commend the member for Warren Blackwood because I know she's very active in her community uh, in working with a number of organisations, a number of people to uh, ensure that this is a transition um, that, that, she, that, it, that the government has a central role in managing. And so I know that it's almost in her mind to be a part of managing those transitions to protect her community. Um, members, uh, there's been uh, a number of um, contributions on this bill already, but I think uh, it's important to note that this bill amends the Forest Products Act um, 2000, and the main purpose of it is to provide the Forest Products Commission with, its, with the ability to own, deal and trade in carbon assets in relation to plantation resources. 
um, and that it will help um, the state to enter the lucrative carbon offsets market, generating revenue and future carbon industry jobs for Western Australia. And in that sense, it is very forward-looking. It understands that our industries are changing. It understands that we need to change to take advantage of the opportunities that these kinds of transitions are presenting all around the world. And if we don't move to do that, we will be left behind in much the same way the Luddites were left behind when they refused to acknowledge um, that, that technology, I think in that case, uh, perhaps it was the wheel or something similar. <laughs> Maybe not the wheel. But you know, technology was coming, and at the time, you know, people were very threatened by it. The change is happening. So happening all around us all the time, so it's essential that we step up and respond to that rather than stick our head in the sand. Um, and so that's why I think this is a very um, sound bill. I'm also excited because really at the heart of it is a recognition of the important role that carbon can play uh, in our economy and in our response to climate change. So, as I said, at the heart of this is recognising that the work that trees do when they're in the ground actually has value uh, because of emerging carbon um, trading markets. So, this will allow the state to receive revenue from the sale of carbon assets um, in markets that are developing quite rapidly. Uh, and so there's an alternative then for uh, forest products to be able to generate resources for the state government. We don't have to cut them down to get a return on revenue. We can look to what the future holds and be a part of that. This bill also empowers the Forest Products Commission to purchase land for the purpose of establishing plantations so that they can engage in those emerging industries. Um, so in that sense, I think it's a sound bill that recognises the future is coming, the future is here whether we like it or not. And our job as a government is to manage those transitions, as I said earlier, to protect um, communities but working people and make sure we take advantage of those opportunities, creating the new jobs it will deliver. Now, members will know that the McGowan government has made a commitment to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. The McGowan government accepts the science on climate change. And again, uh, this shouldn't be radical, but when we compare the federal government's approach, where uh, they have really had an um, appalling position on this for some time, we understand that climate change is real and acknowledge that it's already had a significant impact both on our environment and on our community, and that that is ongoing whether we like it or not. So the state budget has contributed resources to be able to act and address the state's contribution to global emissions. So $750 million has already been committed to um, the Climate Action Fund, which will do a number of things to drive a low carbon future for this state. Uh, one of those um, uh, things worth mentioning is the uh, record $350 million that's been um, invested to expand the state's softwood plantation estate. Um, again, a really important initiative that will create local jobs um, and also ensure that we've got a strong and sustainable timber industry into the future. So sustainably produced Western Australian plantation timber will play a key role as we address um, the challenge that is climate change. Um, members, what I wanted to do uh, in the time available to me today, as well as um, acknowledging the really significant um, aspects of this bill and really the fact that it is part of a, a suite of initiatives that uh, are so essential to managing transitions in the economy. When I was preparing my comments today and thinking about this bill, um, I, I, I kept reflecting um, on what an important decision it was that the McGowan government has made to protect our native um, forests. And I kept reflecting on what that meant for me. And I know a number of members in their comments, perhaps on this bill and others, have, have made those personal reflections. Um, so this bill, while it's really important to uh, recognising that the commercial value of our forests um, are not just in, in cutting them down, but also in ensuring that they are able to um, be recognised for their contribution to carbon markets, I think when we think of our forests, many people don't just think about them as things of commercial or economic value. We think about them as things of um, a great deal of subjective value. And I think for all of us, um, we would probably have uh, a number of sort of personal feelings and reflections about our time in those um, native forests of Western Australia. It's impossible to stand in the native forest of Western Australia and not be struck by its beauty and its, its magnificence. 
Um, so I really wanted in my comments today to speak a little bit about that and I wanted to tell, um, uh, uh, reflect on some, um, I suppose, personal uh, attachments for me. And in doing that I wanted to talk particularly about the work of West Australian artist Howard Taylor. Now Howard Taylor has been described as one of Australia's leading modernist artists and one of Australia's most revered artists. Um, yet many West Australians wouldn't immediately recognise his name. People reached for Google to look it up um, to go, who is this Western Australia? His work's displayed in our art gallery and also in federal parliament. And I wanted to talk about Howard Taylor in my contributions um, today, really for two things, two reasons. Firstly, I wanted to do it because uh, as well as being a well-respected Western Australian artist, he loved our native forests. And much of his work, um, which is significant, is about capturing the uniqueness and that um, beauty of our southwest forests. He spent his life seeking to do that. I also wanted to talk particularly about Howard Taylor today because in my house, Howard Taylor is also referred to as Grandad. Now, I hasten to add, there's no genetic um, line from his, him to me, and I have none of his artistic talents, but he's my husband's maternal grandfather. Um, and while I only met him later, later in years um, and only knew him for a relatively short time, I wanted to talk about him today because he did so love our forest and as I mentioned he spent 55 years as an artist capturing that unique beauty of our southwest forests. Um, now you might not recognise his name but there's a fairly good chance that many of you might have seen his works. Um, they not only hang in the Western Australian Gallery, um, but he's produced a number of pieces of prominent public art. Um, some of you who've been around for a while might remember the Black Stump, which was commissioned by the A&P Society and lived outside their building on St George's Terrace um, before it was relocated when that corner was redeveloped and moved to the Western Australian the University of Western Australia near the Octagon Gallery. He's got a number of works on the grounds of Curtin University um, and again for people of my vintage I remember visiting that library and seeing his tall columns um, that stood outside the entrance to the library, the Robertson Library there. He also um, has an installation, um, the member for Bunbury will be interested to hear this, called Forest Trees, uh, which is an eight metre sculpture out the front of the city of Bunbury building that they commissioned him to produce. He was also commissioned during his life to produce installations that hung at the Fremantle Port Authority, although I'm not sure that it's still there. I think the building's re been redeveloped since that time. And the WA government commissioned um, him to produce an artwork called Compass and Perspective that was a gift from the people of Western Australia to the federal parliament on the occasion of the new parliament house opening in 1988. In addition to UWA and Curtin, his works are also found at Edith Cowan University and, to be found, and can be found in the Holmes of Court Collection, the National Gallery of Australia, as well as the art galleries of New South Wales, South Australia and Queensland. Um, so he has a significant body of work and as I said, he worked for more than 55 years. Um, he was also made a member of the Order of Australia in 1989 and was honoured as a living treasure by this government uh, in 1999 whilst he was still alive. He's sadly no longer with us. But for all his success, um, Howard had very little interest in these kinds of awards and public accolades. He pursued his art, um, not for fame or for fortune. He really made only a very modest living from his art during his lifetime. But he was incredibly passionate about his work. And as I said, for more than 55 years, it was our unique native forests that inspired him and the unique light of Western Australia that he tried to capture. He wasn't um, someone who uh, was uh, initially of a great artistic talent. He was born in 1918 and he moved to Perth in 1932. Uh, he attended the Perth Modern School and he was best known actually for his football and his athletics um, rather than his artistic pursuits. But in 1937 he joined this Royal Australian Air Force and was sent to World War II. He was captured and interned as a prisoner of war um, in May 1940 and he spent his time as a prisoner of war learning to draw with materials that were provided by the Red Cross. Um, he perhaps had little else to do with his time as a prisoner of war and there were plenty of people willing to be his life models. On his release he, um, and while in London he met and married Sheila Smith and they returned back to Perth together in 1946. He first lived in Bickley in what was then um, a very bushy environment 
um, on 24 hectares of bush um, and started painting while still working part-time at the Perth Technical College. But in 1967, he and Sheila moved to Northcliffe where they lived um, in a bush block and they lived there for the remainder of both their lives. And it was here that I first um, met him and first visit, visited, visited. Now, as you can imagine, um, it was a, a relatively small bush block and it was thick with jarrah and carry trees. Um, and Howard lived in a pretty um, simple and small home. So if you can imagine a house built entirely of floorboards on the floors, the walls and the ceiling, uh, that was the nature of it. He had built it himself. Um, it had four simple rooms, very small rooms, um, and is best described as a kind of log cabin, very modest sort of home. He had on that same block though, a significant and large studio, very big studio, vast workspace with an enormous window that looked out over the stands of Carry and Jarrah um, in that area. And members, he worked every day in that studio, even as he aged, um, he would work from early morning until it became too dark to stay there. Um, he never, uh, for the time that I knew him, took a day off, although I do believe um, he did take some time off to come to our wedding. He had no time for socialising, little interest for any kind of other leisure activities, um, although both he and um, his wife Sheila did love their extended family, and they also loved their German shepherd dogs. Um, they had variously four or five that lived in the tiny wood um, log cabin with them, so it was rather crowded. So he wasn't someone who was interested in fame and fortune from his art, but he was driven by a passion to capture the beauty of our native forests. He never attended exhibition openings um, and had little interest in all of that. But he was interested in our bush and he was interested, as I said earlier, in our unique natural light that we enjoy here in Western Australia. Now, there's been um, books written of him. One in particular was subtitled Forest Figure, which gives you a sense of how closely um, uh, the forests were allied to his work and how dedicated he was to capturing it. And I think when I reflect on our forests, I reflect very much um, on Howard Taylor's work and I think it gives us, uh, or gives me certainly, a great understanding about the fact that our native forests are a unique and special gift and then I think we have a responsibility to protect them. Um, Acting Speaker, can I have a short... Extension question? granted. Now, I think we can all relate as we stand in the forest to seeing the beautiful sort of dappled sun that comes through the canopies um, and the way light moves and reflect, reflects. And I think, you know, we can all sort of um, picture the forests at a distance and the, and the way in a hot Australian summer, the kind of um, shimmer that comes off our, our native forests. Um, and anyone who's ever really um, admired the intricacies of, of the burl of Jarrah wood and the, the grain that, that it has will understand that our forests are unique and they are special um, and it is our duty to protect them. Um, and not just protect them because they are a, you know, a, unique, a uniquely West Australian feature, but I think to also understand that they are a unique part of our Western Australian identity. They are part of who we are, which is why Howard's work was so, um, so many public commissions for his work uh, really underlined that many organisations understood that here was someone who could capture not just the beauty of our forests, but their uniqueness, and in doing that, say something about the uniqueness of Western Australia, the uniqueness and special part of who we are. Um, and I think we understand WA is a special and unique place. We see it all the time. Uh, we, we make much of our quokkas on Rottnest Island, again, part of our unique cultural heritage. Uh, we make much of our sunsets over the Indian Ocean, again, a unique and beautiful part of who we are. Um, so uh, Howard Taylor and artists like him understand that the unique, that our forests are a unique treasure and that I think um, he spent his life trying to capture that and tell us a unique story about Western Australia. And I think it's our responsibility to preserve those forests for future generations so that his story and others like it make sense to the generations of Western Australians that come along after us. Um, we know that arts are important to us all, that they are a way of telling a story, not just um, of who we are, but our place in history and the world. And I think when you consider the work of Howard Taylor and his depiction of the West Australian landscape, you can only come to the conclusion that our native forests are a unique gift. So, members, I was very happy to have the opportunity to speak about this bill. 
Um, because for me, it's a way of recognising the important work that the McGowan government is doing to transition our economy, to protect communities, to protect workers, um, to make sure that we are taking advantage of emerging opportunities in the forest industry. But for me as well, I reflect this, um, a, a decision to protect our native forests is a really significant and important decision that is um, of value to anyone who spent time in the forest. But I think it's an important decision for anyone who values Western Australia as a unique and special place. And I think all of us who come here to represent people of Western Australia do understand that we are living in a unique and special place. It is a great um, gift to have the opportunity to be here to protect the uniqueness of Western Australia. So this bill is important for a number of reasons. It's not just about commercialising our forests to make sure that they have value in the ground, although it does that, and I think that is significant for all the reasons I outlined in the beginning of my contribution, but it does much more than that. Um, it does protect, um, it, it underlines the work that this government is doing to protect our forests for future generations, to protect our special cultural heritage and ensure that it is around for the generations of people who will come after us. Um, so that people who are inspired by the work of artists like Howard Taylor can actually go and see the forests um, that were his inspiration and can experience them for themselves, rather than being reduced to simply looking at an artwork hanging in a gallery and trying to make sense of what is the unique and beautiful landscape that we enjoy here in Western Australia. And with that, Acting Speaker, I'll commend the bill to my into the House, thank the Minister for his work on it and conclude my comments.